Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to those uh, here present in uh, Washington and to those uh, joining us by live stream. I'm Tom Conley from the American Chemical Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion on the Chemical Enterprise 2017 Policy Predictions. This is the 227th installment of the ACS's Science in the Congress series that dates back to 1995. ACS is a nationally chartered not-for-profit organization with over 156,000 members, uh, including chemists, chemical engineers, and related professionals. Our members are actively involved in solving some of the world's toughest challenges, and ACS is one of the world's leading sources of authoritative scientific information. Today's program is the final installment in a series of discussion-based briefings that ACS Science and the Congress started to host last fall. Panelists will share their thoughts on how a given policy topic may be considered at the national level during 2017 in the context of a new administration and a new Congress. Specifically, today's panel will consider what 2017 may bring to the chemical enterprise, including the industrial sector. Domestically, last year's revision to the Toxic Substances Control Act and possible changes in trade and tax policies must be considered. Internationally, the ramifications of Brexit and swings in energy production and prices and economic growth rates present uncertainty. Today's panel will present uh, their thoughts with our moderator, and then they will be open to your questions, both live here in Washington and via the live stream. But before we begin, let me share a couple housekeeping items. Uh, before you leave today, please fill out an evaluation form. It helps uh, steer and uh, help us select programs going forward and, and leave them in the table uh, near the entrance here as you, as you came in. I also ask that you silence your cell phones. And finally, if you're watching via live stream and wish to ask a question, please sign into YouTube using a Google account and then type your question as a comment below the video screen. Today's moderator is Dr. William Carroll. His biography and those of the other panelists is in the handout today, so I will be brief. Bill is presently an independent consultant and also a faculty member at Indiana University, having retired from the Occidental Chemical Company in 2015. He currently serves on the American Chemical Society's Board of Directors. He formerly served as chairman of that Board of Directors and also is a past president of ACS. So Bill, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Tom, and welcome to you all. Um, I, I have the privilege of introducing the panel for this afternoon. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that, I, that, that these are also some friends of mine, and I think we'll have a lot of fun this afternoon. I want to start to my immediate left is Jennifer, Jennifer Abril. She's president and CEO of the Society of Chemical Manufacturers and Affiliates, known as SACMA. SACMA is dedicated to specialty chemical manufacturers, distributors, and affiliated service providers. Previously, Jennifer was president of the International Fragrance Association and has worked at the American Chemistry Council. To her left is Lynn Burgesson, owner of Burgesson & Campbell, PC, where she uh, counsels corporations, trade associations, and business consortia on a wide range of issues, including chemical hazard, risk assessment, and policy matters. She's earned an international reputation for her deep and expansive understanding of both US and EU regulatory programs that pertain to chemicals and commerce, and also emerging transformative technologies, including nanotechnology and biotechnology. Uh, finally, all the way over on, on my left is Phil Swagel, who is an economist and professor in international economic policy at the Maryland School of Public, Public Policy, and is also a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. From 2006 to 2009, he was Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the Treasury Department, where he advised Secretary Paulson on all aspects of economic policy and analysis on issues including macroeconomic forecasts. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to, to let each of you make a, a couple of opening remarks. I have a number of topics. I have a feeling, and I felt from the very beginning, that with this panel about all you have to do is drop the puck 
<laughs> and, and, and you're good for the next hour and a half. But I am going to try to steer things just a little bit. We have a number of, of, of topics I'd like to touch. Jennifer, go right ahead. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, so I would like to thank ACS in particular for uh, inviting me to participate today. And uh, we're thrilled as SACMA to be a participant in this, and we really value our relationship with ACS. So thanks so much. Check your mic, please. Are you on? Be on the top. Better. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so with that, um, we are. Uh, as most industries preparing for the transition of the administration and what that means uh, with our membership. Uh, as you mentioned, our membership is uh, based in the business of specialty chemical industry and uh, we have uh, high value products in low volumes that are for uh, applications that are highly customized and add uh, tremendous value to end products. So we are um, in a very entrepreneurial space in the chemical industry. Uh, we're very responsive and flexible and nimble. And um, that is a particular aspect that uh, is transformative in this industry. And we'd like to see that uh, continue to be an important perspective uh, that both the Congress and the administration value and share. Um, so we'll be looking at uh, policies and uh, trends that would be of importance and, um, and value to our members. And those are some of the types of things that, uh, that we have uh, in mind presently. Very good, Lynn. Well, thank you, Bill, for the kind introduction and thank you all for being here and my thanks to ACS for sponsoring this uh, event and the many others that it does. Um, I speak as a practitioner, largely in the chemical community and I'm very, very happy that the Toxic Substances Control Act was fundamentally reformed in many good ways um, and anxious to work with the Trump administration to ensure that the spirit and letter of the new law is being carried out and implemented in a way that best serves the American public, the chemical community, and every shareholder engaged in the chemical enterprise. I'm hopeful that that will happen. And again, I think EPA is doing a really good job and hope that that support continues as the months and years evolve. Uh, as a lawyer, uh, I am also hopeful that the rule of law will be maintained uh, by the Trump administration. And as a very active member of the American Bar Association and several other associations, I'm hopeful that the emphasis on implementing the law and following it will continue to be uh, followed in the new administration. Phil. Thanks, thanks, Lynn. Phil? Great. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks for including me. Um, so I, I think I, I, I'm here to think about the broad economy and the, the uh, changes in policy that will affect the broad economy and then, of course, how that affects the chemical enterprise. Um, and, you know, we'll get into details uh, in, in a minute, but I had just sort of an overview um, thought, which is that there's a sense in which now we're, we just face different challenges than we have over, say, the last eight years, or even beyond that, you know, 10 or 11 years. Um, then since we finally moved from the crisis period or the kind of aftermath of the crisis, and I think have a chance to look up and look ahead um, and, and think of, of a longer term, and it just suggests different challenges. And so I think of the, the near-term challenges as being growth and job creation. Um, there's a sense in which what, what we've seen over the last couple of years, you know, since in some sense we, we said, okay, we're, we're done with the crisis, um, it hasn't felt like it to, to many Americans. And of course, that, that transmits all the way down um, to every industry. Uh, and so there, the, the challenge then is to say, well, what's missing in the recovery? And by far, the biggest missing piece is business investment. Uh, and that, you know, we see across a, a, a variety of, um, of sectors, uh, energy is, is an important one. So what's, uh, you know, this is what, what will be done and what will be the effect? And then that feeds into job creation, uh, wage growth, uh, many other things. The things that sort of cause, I think, many Americans to, to step back and say, well, is this really it? Is this as good as we get? And obviously, you know, many people voted, or at least in, in key states in the upper Midwest, voted uh, in a way consistent with saying, no, that's not good enough. We're not satisfied. We want change. Um, so that's kind of a short run. And then a longer term, I think of challenges um, broadly in terms of sustainability. And I mean there, uh, economic sustainability, and right, we have important challenges with, with fiscal policy uh, in particular, that's it's not sustainable and, and needs changes. 
but is, is very difficult, you know, both technically and politically. And then other kinds of sustainability, uh, environmental, climate, um, social uh, as well, um, thinking of inequality and, and, and uh, uh, related issues, education, training, lots of things like that. So it's a, so it's a, it's a challenging time. It's a different set of challenges, I think, than what we've considered over the last couple of years. But um, that's, you know, so all eyes are looking at, uh, you know, both policymakers and I think the American people to see where we'll go. Great. Thanks, Phil. I, it, here's, here's how I'd like to try, to try to do this. We have a number of topics to, 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 to get to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm going to, in many cases, I'll just throw them to you to start with, Phil, and I'd like you to kind of tee <laughs> things up. And then from the perspective of perhaps um, both the larger and the smaller chemistry enterprise to talk a little bit about what they mean. You know, as I look at the situation today, it's almost like if you're, playing Scrabble and you decided to wait one turn, just dump all your tiles and take seven new ones. To where now you're looking at an entirely different deck than you, than, than, than you were looking at, at, at a few months ago. And, and so I, th I, think, and I think that's one of the things that, that people try to get some clarity on. So let, let me just start kind of big picture. Mm -hmm. Lots of discussions about the big trade agreements. So whether it's, whether it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership and us dropping out of it, or it's renegotiating NAFTA. Phil, what, is that, what does it mean? What does it mean to us realistically to have dropped out of TPP? And, and, and how do you re renegotiate NAFTA? How do you do that? OK, sure. Um, I mean, I would start with the fundamental that, uh, that trade and uh, global economic interactions are fundamentally good for the United States, although they have different effects on different people within the, United, within the country and within the economy. And that, of course, that's, that's the policy challenge. Um, you know, I think we all understood over the last six to, to 12 months that the United States was not going forward with the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And that was regardless of who won, of who won the election. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a challenge. Um, you know, renegotiating NAFTA, there's a sense in which we, we, you know, we have that discussion at the start of every new administration, right? Senator Obama promised to do the same thing as, uh, you know, when, when he ran for president. Um, and, you know, my, my sense that the governments of Mexico and Canada say, yeah, look, we get it. It's, you know, it's not just a, a kind of a line, but we need to actually look at this. And, you know, it's been, I think NAFTA overall has been very good for the, um, the hemisphere, for North America, uh, good for Mexico in particular, which in some ways has benefited the most uh, if, you, if you look at the, you know, Mexico economy since their, their crisis in the mid-90s, has benefited the most from NAFTA, but it's natural to make changes. Um, I, I can talk more in detail about that uh, in a second, but I, I was just going to think about the global, the global picture. And to me, the challenge is, well, how do we keep the benefits of this global economic integration while making it socially and politically acceptable? Um, I look at Prime Minister Abe, who was here uh, last, um, I say every day feels like weeks <laughs> or something. So maybe he was here. It feels like he was here a couple months ago. But um, this uh, he was here just, just this weekend and uh, in, uh, in Florida as well. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for Japan, TPP is really important. Um, There's a sense in which right, TPP would have allowed the prime minister to do some things politically that were uh, some things in, in the Japanese economy that were necessary but politically difficult. And that's a very common thing, you know, for the Japanese government to say, ah, oh, we don't want to do this, but we're going to, you know, open our economy. We're going to do it because we have to for TPP. And I think we can get some of those same benefits. And obviously, Prime Minister Abe was working to build a relationship with, uh, with our president to, uh, to move that forward. So that's what I look for in the international um, uh, trade arena that will continue with, with uh, economic integration, but it might be more, more bilateral. It might be more in fits and starts. Uh, let me just end with one thought for the uh, chemical industry, which is on energy. Um, and I think, um, ironically, on the energy side, uh, you know, in contrast to other areas where international economic integration is more controversial, in the energy, it seems like we're going to get more of it. Right? We already know we're going to get more um, transportation of, uh, of energy-related products right? across the, the U.S.-Canadian border in particular, but I wouldn't be surprised if we get it on the southern border as well, right, as Great. Mexico continues Agreed. to open up its sector. Um, it seems like lower energy prices are fundamentally good for the chemical industry, but ironically, there have been at times when chemical firms have been against economic integration when they think it will lead to higher energy prices. And of course, this is oil exports uh, in particular. But given that we have uh, it, an incredibly agile U.S. energy sector now, and you'd expect the supply response to really be very, very rapid, you know, opening up and, and to further energy exports. I suspect will lead to more, so even more of a supply response that will um, 
uh, hold off energy price increases. So I'm looking at the kind of you know, the Dow chemicals of the world and saying, hey, you were in some sense previously talking about your own kind of narrow interest as opposed to the overall economy. You know, I, know, I know they wouldn't put it that way, but you know, sort of looking at it as an outsider, that's, that's the way it sure seems like it. You know, it has the situation changed, and are you, you know, not, not just them in particular, but others willing to, uh, you know, are able to see the broader picture? So Lynn, anything in there you could pick at? Uh, well, I just wanted to echo many of the same themes that Phil offered, that you know, globalization in the chemical community seems to be more an inevitability and a desired outcome, and that the current focus on diminished globalization with stronger borders and a more protectionist economy strikes me as being uniquely disadvantageous, uh, particularly to this, to this community. Um, and at the cost of energy, the uncertainty that some of these um, differences of opinion and shifts in policy I think is also adding to another element of uncertainty and a lack of clarity causes disequilibrium in virtually all sectors of the economy, but perhaps maybe uniquely to the chemical enterprise simply because it is so interrelated with our trading partners and the economies of nations that we... But let's, let, let's, let's, let's drill down on that just for a second okay. because for the large scale chemistry enterprise, for the large companies, um, we have been net exporters of, of things, and particularly as Phil points out, you know, maybe we're going to wind up exporting more in the way of, of LNG or ethane or, or other, other commodities. Doesn't this kind of work two ways, that if you start abrogating trade agreements that it can work against you well, as, an, as an exporter? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the elements of uncertainty and concern that is a logical outgrowth with this type of change in policy that the opportunities are diminished, the consequences could be severe, it could be closing markets, causing a net increase in our own cost, the reprisals that we've heard about already from the Mexican economy, a very important trading uh, entity for purposes of the US chemical community, given how much goes over the border and then comes back in, unlike our the example with China, where a lesser amount comes in per dollar of, of uh, US dollars exported. So absolutely, it's a two-way street. Can I, to, can I just mention, mention one thing? I just want to pick up on one word, which is out, the word abrogate. And my understanding is that we're not looking to abrogate anything. And that you know, NAFTA, for example, had a, um, you know, part of NAFTA was the ability to renegotiate it. So um, yeah, so I, I, I just want to make sure we don't you know, sort of go too far in, in, in our concern. Um, uh, over things. And I, I think it's that, that, that's easy to do if you, if you get caught up in some of the rhetoric yeah. that's, that, that's you know, meant to be a bumper sticker. You know, the question is, is that the way it's executed? Jennifer, different perspective from the smaller part of the chemistry enterprise? I, I think most, most of uh, what has already been discussed here is, is shared. Um, I know we had been certainly preparing for um, a move ahead with TPP and uh, we were a little surprised, like most, um, that that was uh, not going to be um, moving forward in the same direction that we anticipated. So uh, changing gears a bit, um, specifically on NAFTA, Mexico and Canada are very important trading partners for our membership. Um, we certainly don't want a dissolution of, of NAFTA. We would be in favor of some tweaks uh, to it. I think, um, as was said already, uh, there are natural evolutions in some of these agreements that have been um, around for decades in particular. Uh, so maybe the time could be appropriate to take a, another look at what is working, what could be improved upon. Um, but with that comes some risks that uh, you could uh, find yourself in a situation where if these talks were to fail, uh, we certainly wouldn't want any kind of retaliation um, in other ways that have, that have happened, unfortunately, in other sectors um, with, with other trading partners uh, in the past. So, so tweaks, what, if, 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 you could, if you could tell the negotiators anything, what would you tell them? Well, I think a couple of the benefits that we continue to see are rules of origin, duty drawback allowance, things like that that, that continue to um, support uh, our members and that our members are benefiting from and, and need in order, in order to do uh, their business. Um, but there are, you know, there are opportunities uh, for, for, the, uh, for the parties to, to perhaps benefit. I think the economies have changed for all of us over these decades. Um, the types of labor and environment types of provisions that were worked out 
years ago. Um, there's been an evolution in some of this, and, and so perhaps the time now could be to at least modernize um, some of those provisions. Tweaks, Lynn, to NAFTA? Well, I know one of the areas that we are we're hopeful about is NAFTA had provided a really good opportunity to help raise the environmental bar south of the border, recognizing that we have very stringent environmental protections in this country. And some of the reasons exports were going elsewhere was in, in an effort to avoid some of the consequences of more rigorous regulation here. And if, if NAFTA were to be amended, it would be helpful if some of those environmental equities could be on a more commensurate basis to eliminate the incentive for exporting, a primary example being uh, lead acid battery reclamation activities. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the domestic um, secondary lead acid battery market is exported to either Mexico or Korea uh, because it is financially advantageous to do so. Uh, it would be nice if that could be halted because environmental controls are at a level commensurate with what they are here to eliminate um, exporting a reclamation yes. market yeah. because secondary lead smelters are an important part of the secondary community. Uh, we have adequate capacity in this country and it's underutilized, which is causing job loss in this country. And just the exodus of a, a reclamation activity that could give rise to environmental harm by virtue of the materials at issue is not something that our U.S. law or participation in NAFTA should countenance. Well, and we could, we could spend an entire session of this on oh, reclamation yes. recycling. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I want to go a little bit different direction. Tell me, uh, you, you hear some discussion in terms of, uh, from the Republicans about a border adjustment tax with, with the idea of, of, of changing our, our policy, with the idea of, of, of encouraging more exports. Tell me a little about that and, 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 and what, 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 what do what, what people say it would do. Okay, sure, sure. I mean, I. I Actually, first I was thinking we're going to move from lead acid to zinc, and then <laughs> anyway, that's just you know. Um, I, there, I've, I've exhausted my chemical. Uh, <laughs> right now. So um, no, um, uh, so uh, the way I think of the border adjustment is that it's part of a, a bigger picture of tax reform, right? The U.S. This is on, on especially in the corporate side, but the proposal from uh, Chairman Brady and Speaker Ryan in, in the House is all encompassing. It includes both the, the personal side and the business side and the international tax side. So all aspects of the, uh, the tax code. Um, uh, the border adjustment in some sense just, just reframes our tax base to be domestic sales. Right? The, the current tax system is a sets of a hierarchy of advantages. Right? So the, the most advantaged companies are foreign companies that produce in other countries and sell into the U.S. Right? The U.S. is the, the highest corporate, on the, this is on the corporate side, the highest corporate tax rate. Other countries, you know, among the advanced economies generally have lower. Some of them have considerably lower. Think of our, uh, Ireland, for example. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big uh, incentive to set up in Ireland or at least invert, move a corporate headquarters to Ireland and sell into the U.S. So that's the, the biggest advantage. The next biggest advantage are American firms um, that produce overseas or invert their headquarters overseas and sell them to the US, right? they get to, to defer their tax burden. And then coming in last place are American companies that stay in the US, produce in the US, have their headquarters in the US, they face the highest tax burden. Which in some sense doesn't, right, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it, it's of course frustrating to everyone when we see jobs moving overseas and headquarters moving overseas. But you look at our tax system and you say, okay, well, I, I get the incentives. I don't like it, but that's the incentives. And so the border adjustment is part of a two-step process, right? The, the first step is to lower the rates, right? The, the Brady-Ryan plan will lower rates, in particular the corporate rate, where the U.S. is just out of line with the rest of the world. And there's a sense in which, right, we, we do worse for our economy while raising less revenue, right? So we, sometimes we couldn't do worse than we have now, virtually. Um, so that's step one, is making the, our tax system more competitive. But then step two is saying, well, let's get rid of these incentives. The incentive to invert, the incentive to move jobs overseas, that comes about because of the hierarchy that I mentioned. And the border adjustment instead says, anyone selling in the US will face the same tax burden, regardless of where you're located or where your headquarters is. And anyone selling into another country will face the same tax burden. Right? So American firms that produce here and sell to Ireland won't, won't face the higher US uh, uh, corporate tax they'll only face the Irish, uh, the Irish tax. And of course, the, their shareholders will still face the US income tax uh, 
You know, so that, that won't change. It's not like they're, they're getting away tax-free. It's just on the corporate side. Well, as any company selling to the U.S. will face the U.S. Uh, taxes. So, so let me, let, yeah, let so me, be, let me be clear here. Um, if, if that means that if we lowered our rate to, I don't know, 25%, yeah. and the Irish rate is, what, 12 13%, yeah. that you would expect the border adjustment tax to be the delta between those for things that come in from that, from that country? Is yeah, that, the, is that um, the sort in of thing? Irish, So an Irish company, so, so the first, the, 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 this is the, the way to start to think about that question is that to keep in mind that, that Ireland like every other advanced economy, already has a border adjustment, right? This is why when you, you know, leave the airport in France or Germany, you get a rebate from the VAT. Mm -hmm. You've paid, that is the border adjustment, right? So every other country has a border adjustment. And so an Irish company selling into the US, their goods and services sold to American companies would face the 20 or 25% uh, uh, tax on their goods and services sold into the US, and therefore would be on an even basis against American companies also selling in the U.S. So, Lynn, talk a little bit about tax from, from, from your perspective and, and whether there's a reform necessary, and if so, what, what, mm -hmm. what should be coming for, for the industry? What, 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 is, what does the industry see as, as what it would like in this area? You know, I don't want to speak for my clients. Um, and um, as far as the chemical industry is concerned, is that your question? Bill? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm sure... Or you could answer another one if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> well, tax is not my cup of tea, other than I pay too, much, too many of them. Uh, but I think, uh, just listening to Phil, this seems like an eminently reasonable approach to eliminating some of the incentives that have drawn off corporate headquarters and sucked off jobs into foreign economies because of a perception that the tax treatment is preferred. I know from a corporate perspective, you all want to reward your shareholders in a way that keeps companies sustainable and profitable, but not to me to the detriment of either the U.S. economy as a whole and perhaps bettering um, other nation states in a way that disadvantages us. So to the extent that there can be some tax neutrality or at least equality, that strikes me as an eminently sensible goal to maintain from a policy perspective. Jennifer, from the, the small chemical industry perspective, any, any thoughts there? Well, from the specialty perspective, um, <clears throat> So we, you may know that, that um, there are quite a number of industries that are starting to follow the proposals here um, under this broader adjustment tax. And um, as an organization, we haven't habitually followed tax policy per, per se, but we've been um, actively involved with trade and tariffs. Um, I think all of this now is coming to a meld together. Um, and particularly with this, um, we had some question early on in this proposal when looking at this proposal about whether we were talking about finished goods or raw materials and what the impact of that is. And it really is on all goods, goods and services, so, or all goods. Um, and so for us, having such a robust supply chain that is global, uh, we would be looking at higher raw material costs, and that would be uh, a difficult position to be in for our members. So um, we know that uh, about 80% of active manufacturer, sorry, active pharmaceutical ingredients, for example, is manufactured outside of the U.S. And there's a high percentage of raw materials um, on the industrial chemical side as well uh, that are coming from uh, as imports. And so that raises questions about, you know, how would our members handle the rise in those higher prices, and and would we be able to? either absorb those, which we wouldn't want to do, can they be passed along um, throughout the supply chain, um, but it will have an impact on the entire supply chain because it's affecting all of the, um, all of, all of the raw materials and, and the finished goods themselves. Um, and so we anticipate there could be some supply chain disruption as well. Um, that cost containment would be a huge uh, issue for us to try to continue to, to figure out how we, how we would manage through that. Um, the other thing that I understand is that there may be some question, some have raised whether uh, this is uh, a, potentially could violate the WTO rules. Um, so I think that still has to be worked out as well. Um, and then the perception that perhaps this could be a uh, win for other economies. Uh, China in particular has been raised as, um, as a country that may have some opportunity to uh, take this as a, as a win for themselves. Um, so I think 
you know, we're still, we are following this. We are part of a coalition that's, um, that's following this. And it's gotten us a little closer to tax policy than we've been in the past. What do you think the chances are? Uh, it's a, t you know, it's a, it's hard to know. Um, uh, and what we're, we're speaking at uh, 1230, I guess President Trump is just starting a press conference. Um, and you, you never know what he'll uh, endorse or not endorse. Um, and he talked about the tax policy yesterday a little bit. That's, that's a pretty so, bold prediction there. Yeah, it, um, <laughs> that's right. It's just, you know, it's just my observation. Um, I was, actually, I was going to say, I'm always skeptical when economists try to be political analysts. So um, I'm, I'm keenly aware of uh, my limitations here. Um, it's hard to know. I, I look at the, the tax proposal, and obviously you, you heard what I had to say. I think it's a, it's a good one. It, it's analytically sound. It'd be good for the U.S. economy. Um, but, but I recognize the, um, this is the, the issues that were just brought up, um, that uh, you know, the supply chain is one, import prices another, and there's a sense which has just changed, right? We have one system. I can say, look, everyone else in the world has already gone to this other system, but it's still changed, and that's, you know, that's always politically and economically, kind of administratively, um, that's difficulty. On the supply chain side, uh, it, to me, what's interesting, uh, on the chem and then going to the chemical industry, is looking at the reaction from some firms in particular. And um, so this is the, the most voluble uh, on the chemical side is so far the, uh, the Coke, um, Coke Industries, right? Which, uh, you know, they've made the point that they produce lots in the US, but I gather that their opposition to the tax uh, is related to the refinery uh, business, which, you know, involves imported um, raw materials, uh, imported energy products. Um, and now, in principle, right, the, uh, you know, the, the economic textbook would tell you that this change in the, the tax should feed through into a concomitant change in the value of the dollar, and that would offset the impact, right? So if the, you know, the, the price of imported um, uh, you know, goods and services goes up because of the 20% border tax, well, the dollar will get stronger by 25%, uh, you know, 1 over 0.8. Um, uh, you know, one over one minus 0.2. Uh, since it's a chemical society, I know I can do math here. Um, <laughs> everyone is fine with that, um, which I think is great. Uh, uh, I, I saw a bunch of pencils come out. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, check, just checking me, which is good. Um, so, uh, of course, that's the textbook. Will it actually happen in, in, you know, in, in the real world? Well, there's lots of, um, uh, lots of other factors. I will note one thing that I, I'm pretty sure will happen. And in fact, the reason I know it is because the Coke, Coke industry has put out a study that shows it will happen, and that's that oil prices will go down, right, in, in dollars, right? And now, actually, their study doesn't say that. In fact, it, it kind of says the opposite. It says that Americans at the pump will pay you know, really high gasoline prices because of this proposal. But, but in their paper, if you look through it at the actual substance of the paper, they have charts showing the relationship, um, or showing the value of the dollar. And it's very clear at times when oil prices, uh, when the, I'm sorry, when, at times when the um, uh, when the dollar is strong, uh, their charts show that energy prices are low. Right? So I, I gotta, actually, their chart either shows the, the value of the dollar or energy prices. I think it actually shows energy prices. Um, and if you mentally overlay the value of the dollar against energy prices in their own paper, you see when the dollar is strong, energy prices go down. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, economically, that makes perfect sense. Um, so uh, that implies that um, you know, the effect that I mentioned, the textbook effect, Will you know will happen whether it happens all the way or part of the way is of course that's that's the policy debate. All right, let's let's switch gears. Sure. I just wanted to follow up on one point. Absolutely. Which I thought was a very very good one, and that is, might the tax have a disproportionately adverse effect on medium to smaller chemical producers and importers because bulk chemicals might be able to more easily absorb a cost increase as opposed to specialty chemical manufacturers right. and some of the uniquely innovative smaller companies that, as we talked about earlier, are really feeding the economy through innovation and growth. And how might the trades Well, Jennifer, you brought up those? APIs. I mean, you talk a little bit about you know, the fine chemical industry and, and, and pharmaceuticals and drill down on that a little for us. Yeah, I, I, I think similar um, situation with, with that. Um, so as I mentioned, um, you know, most of the, the Raw material for that is coming coming from overseas, and so some of the things that we're concerned about uh, that may happen is that if uh, if that increases prices, um, we could see some shortages in supply. Some of the things that have happened in the last um, few years have been um, 
in reaction to making sure that that supply chain is free flowing mm -hmm. um, and so that there aren't shortages uh, that that are necessary to make to make the medicines that, ever, that all Americans depend on. Um, so some of these uh, types of, of um, proposals uh, we're concerned may actually find the supply chain of the pharmaceutical industry in, as, as well uh, disrupted. And so we want to make sure that that, of course, doesn't happen. And, and we're, studying, uh, we're studying these proposals and, and kind of looking at, looking at those potential impacts. All right, so now I want to go back to you, Lynn, and let's, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about regulation. And you, know, you brought up Tosca and the new Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act. And we're in the process of, of building out the regulations associated with that. So considering that on the one hand and the, the two out for one in <coughs> regulation that, that the president set forward, how does that work? Talk about, about, about That's um, a really good question. <laughs> um, how will you create new regulations and, and how, how will you offset that with things that come out? Well, I think there are many people in Washington and around the country asking that very question um, because it's one of the things that are much easier said than done. I understand and don't necessarily disagree with trying to diminish the overall economic burden imposed on businesses and others who would be subject to regulatory constraints to try to diminish that in a logical, sensible way. But the kind of arbitrariness of the, for every regulation that comes out, there needs to have a net, uh, co no cost increase. And for every new regulation, you need to see two sunsetting. So the administration of that is both very, very challenging. Even the jurisdictional limits um, of, of the order are unclear. And as we've seen in many articles and in other interpretive memoranda with a view toward just what does it mean? How is it going to work? What kinds of regulations are subject? Who's not subject to it? Uh, Section 2B excludes independent agencies. There are exclusions and waiver opportunities. So at a very big picture level, it's one of those easier said than done. I wish there were greater clarity that provided um, much more instruction to the hardworking men and women in federal agencies everywhere trying to do their job with very little guidance. And now there's this you know, cloud over it, like what can we do, what can fall jurisdictionally either within the scope of the requirement or fall comfortably outside of it. So we don't spend a lot of time and energy on something that doesn't meet the requirements. So I, I'm very concerned about it. Um, I'm From a very parochial perspective, I'm concerned because TSCA needs to be implemented in a very significant way. It's unclear whether these statutorily mandated requirements under the law are, are exempt or are, would otherwise be shielded from the one in, two out requirement. Um, so I, I, I don't have a lot of good things to say about it, Bill. Um, I appreciate and, and laud the effort, but I'm concerned about the lack of clarity, the um, disarray it's causing within the federal bureaucracy, and concerned about the time and effort that will go into implementing it in a way that doesn't necessarily yield demonstrably beneficial outcomes. Jennifer, uh, SOCMA was an active participant in, uh, in, in, the, in all the work that led up to, uh, to redoing TSCA. What's your perspective on this at this point? Yeah, we're, we're thrilled that it continues to uh, have bipartisan support. We have been, as you said, very active in this space. Um, it was a, a tremendous effort by all stakeholders who um, advance an important piece of environmental legislation in a time when uh, when bipartisanship is is uh, rare. Um, but now that um, now that we're seeing some of the implementing rules come out, um, there are ones that we have uh, favorable uh, initial impressions of. There are others we have a few concerns about. Um, but I think all of that is moving forward, as Lynn says, the, the important thing to do is to make sure that we continue to be on track. Um, as we referenced earlier, some of the things that, that do the worst damage is really the business uncertainty. The uncertainty of the operating landscape is the hardest uh, place for a business to be. Um, and circling that back into the, uh, the one and two out, um, as an organization that has long supported regulatory reform efforts and, and um, 
looking at opportunities for making our regulatory system work in a more efficient way. Um, I don't know that we have as many concerns as Lynn has expressed, but what we, what we, what we find is, uh, is even more difficult is that you're looking at major rules, so that $100 million threshold, you know, it's for us, it's a cumulative effect of a number of rules that become this sort of tiramisu of uh, regulatory <laughs> burden, um, rather than just those large uh, overarching rules that, that might have some of this attention. So for us, it's really that combination of, of regulation that, uh, that puts the greatest burden on our membership. So I, I, I've heard it called dog's breakfast, but tiramisu is, 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 is a, a, a new term. It's lunchtime. So where are we? But where are we in, in implementing the new, the new, the new task? Well, I think if, if um, Jim Jones, our recently uh, departed assistant administrator for to toxics, were here, he would be pleased to report that right now I think it's on, on schedule. We have um, some of the, the three very important so-called framework rules were issued uh, all in January in anticipation of the statutorily required June uh, promulgation date. Uh, so we, we are on track with the implementation rules. I think the agency has been very good about scheduling public stakeholder meetings to better um, articulate what its goals are in implementing the law and how it's going about doing so. Seeking public comment in a way that I think we can all appreciate, which greater transparency and participation was a fundamental goal of TSCA reform. So in terms of the implementation, I think EPA has done a really, really good job of being on time, whether it's on budget, won't speak to that. Um, but I also, again, circling back to a, an overarching theme here, the, the regulatory uncertainty, the lack of clarity directionally, who is the new AA. Uh, we've got this Pruitt guy coming in, and what he, what he will he do, if anything, will he put his his seal of approval on continuing bipartisan support for this very important new law. Uh, you know, I don't know. There continues to be considerable disarray within the agency senior staff and just being <coughs> unclear about where the marching orders are coming, whether they will be working with diminished staff, whether they'll be working with diminished budgets, all at a time where more staff and more budget are needed to implement not only this law, but carry out existing regulatory and statutory functionalities. Uh, in areas that are very, very demanding, technically and scientifically. So a long-winded response, Bill, to a very simple question. How are we doing? I think we're doing just fine. Uh, and uh, I hope the agency... Check back will... later. Yeah. Uh, check back later, that's right. So, so Phil, I want to talk a little bit about, about reg reform with you. As I understand it, there, there is a change uh, that, that this administration has in the way they will view cost-benefit analysis. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what the change means? Yeah, it's an, it's, it's an interesting issue. Um, uh, right, the previous administration, um, I, I think it's, it's fair to say, had some challenges with cost-benefit analysis. Um, there's a sense in which, um, you know, I, I think the observation is that the, the ends justified the means um, uh, was, was a bit of the, the philosophy. And, um, you know, that, that doesn't do as well in court. Um, you know, when the cost-benefit analysis or, you know, doesn't exist or um, doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Um, and, and I think it's unfortunate that cost-benefit analysis has become a kind of political uh, football, uh, controversial. I mean, that's what we teach our students. I teach in the policy school uh, at the University of Maryland. We're sitting here at George Washington, which also has a wonderful policy school, and they teach cost-benefit analysis as well. So, um, so that's unfortunate. On the other hand, the solution, I think, is just to do it better. Right, and sometimes it's challenging. You can't always, you know, you can't always do it perfectly, but at least don't make obvious mistakes um, or have obvious gaps that, that leave the administration open to court challenge. So that would be. Uh, so isn't, but it, it, perhaps I'm I'm wrong here. Correct me, but isn't isn't the philosophy of the Trump administration that we're not doing cost benefit analysis anymore? We're doing cost analysis, uh, and no, the benefits are so difficult to quantify that the only thing we can quantify are costs. And that's what we're going to regulate on. That's, that's where we're going with this. Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I, so I look at um, the executive order that came out is a week ago Friday um, on financial side. And that talked about cost-benefit analysis uh, in the context of financial regulation. And so I think that, that applies broadly. Um, and, and, you know, even uh, Governor uh, Teruo, from, um, you know, who just announced that he's leaving the Fed, who was uh, in charge of 
the re financial regulation uh, in the Obama administration effectively. Um, uh, you know, he said, look, that EO I, I supported entirely because it really is a saying, look, here are our principles, and the principles are, are hard to argue with. Like, let's do, it, let's do it well, let's do it right, let's balance costs and benefits and innovation and safety and, and those sorts of things. Um, that, you know, look, uh, the, um, the, the rubber has to meet the road, and we're just not there yet. And that's the, that's All right, the so let me break one more topic. Uh, hang on just one second. Uh, just uh, to, to the audience, let me break one more topic after this. I'll give you a rejoinder, Lynn. Thank you. Um, and, then, and then we'll take some questions from, from the audience. Go. Very briefly, I, I am very troubled because I share Bill's view that the benefit side of the equation seems to be given short shrift. And, and how that might be actualized or incorporated into forthcoming cost-benefit analyses is, is troubling. It's one of the key benefits that the agency has, I think, systematically underappreciated with new chemical development, for example, is how do you quantify the benefit of new pixie dust that replaces mm. old pixie dust uh -huh. that has demonstrably clear disadvantages to either human health or the environment? And eliminating that benefit side, or not giving it the full expression and quantitative analysis it deserves in, for example, new chemical uh, notification under this reform law, um, it is very disturbing. Well, and putting my ACS hat on just for a minute, green chemistry is that new pixie dust that, exactly. that, 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 that does things better in those And lists. I just saw that baby go out with the bathwater. <laughs> <laughs> We're dangerously mixing our metaphors here. Want to want to add something here, here, Jennifer? Well, just to to I think add on to the same same conversation and. Um, from my prior experience, uh, and also now with this experience, there are, it's fascinating from a green chemistry point of view, the anticipation that there will always be a better material that's coming along. Sometimes that is not necessarily the case. Sometimes you can't replace. As you True. mentioned earlier, True. I used to work with the fragrance industry. You, right. can't, you can't take out one olfactive material and not replace it with uh, 10 other ingredients that would make up the same type of a smell. So, um, so I appreciate what you're saying, Lynn, particularly around the new chemicals side of the coin. Um, but I do think that there is some aspect that, to Phil's point earlier, we got very um, interested in seeing the benefits in order to justify the costs. Right. And so maybe we're doing a little bit of a pendulum swing uh, to course correct, but we'll find a balance. Okay, let's go to energy just just briefly so we get this on the table. And Phil, you started you started out with that. Um, let's let's talk about a couple of the, the things that that impact the, the marketplace. First of all, the the OPEC reduction in in uh, uh, production seems to be holding. Um, that I, I I wouldn't have bet on that based on the history. What do you see there? Does that does does that does that continue? Do have they have they learned something? It's yeah. It's it's fascinating that uh, despite the since this rivalry is is not strong enough between the Saudis and uh, the Iranians, that as you say that the the you know their discipline their supply discipline is held together. You know of course that has led to a supply response in the U.S. Um, which in some this right we all know driving around and seeing the the prices at the pump, we just the, the discipline in OPEC has not, not had the same negative impact on, um, you know, on uh, American consumers and users of energy. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see in the face of that, in the face of their, you know, their bilateral difficulties in that, you know, uh, Gulf, Gulf relationship, whether they'll be able to maintain the, uh, di the discipline. Um, at the same time as we, in some sense, you know, probably see yet more of a supply response, you know, given that some of the, the um, limits on, um, you know, in our uh, energy supply uh, industry or transport industry uh, get, get taken away. So one of the things, Lynn, from the perspective of the commodity chemical industry that's mm -hmm. been an advantage for the U.S. over probably the last eight years has been the inexpensive natural gas and, and as, as both as an energy source but as a raw material. Um, comments on, 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 on what you see in the, in, in the future for this, and I realize I'm not asking the economist, I'm, ask, I'm asking the lawyer, but, but what, what, what aspects of, the, of, of this concern you going forward or, or, or do you see as bright spots? Well, I, I would hope that the same discipline that has kept prices in check could continue because, again, it adds to a stable manufacturing you know, much equilibrium, stability in prices in ways that might counterbalance some of the other impacts of tax changes and, and uh, border 
type um, issues. The greater stability we have in the market, the uh, fewer upsets of any significant consequence, the better we will be able to maintain some semblance of equilibrium in the market. So I would hope that they can be stabilized, but without being, without your, your background in economics, uh, Phil, I have no clue if that's a reasonable expectation or simply a, an observation that is, is nice to have. Go ahead. Phil. Yeah, I just, I, you know, as I teach international macroeconomics, and one of the things that you know, we look at in class is the value of the dollar, the exchange value of the dollar. And depending on how you measure it, bilateral or multilateral, the, the dollar has moved by 20, 25 percent over the last several years, you know, f strengthening in 09, then weakening, and then strengthening again. And that is certainly disruptive. On the other hand, uh, you know, the economy does continue, and you know, we don't see shortages of life-threatening medicines when the dollar gains or loses 25 percent. So, um, you know, as if uh, you know, these changes will affect the economy and regulation and other things, but it's easy in some sense to overstate, um, you know, sort of people will die if, you know, if this change is made. That's like a, that's a really breathtaking talking point. Um, that, actually, that, that goes in my list of breathtaking talking points. <laughs> <laughs> so. so, Jennifer, for the specialty chemical industry, yep. energy as important as it is for commodities? Indeed. Um, for many of the same reasons, it's a uh, it's a, a feedstock. We depend, our members depend on that. A number of our um, uh, members are utilizing uh, natural gas and their gas fire, fire, fired boilers. Um, so it is critically important to us. Anything that uh, raises those prices, as as we talked about earlier, would have a direct impact uh, somewhere else along the uh, supply chain. And with those uh, cost constraints uh, being fewer opportunities to f find other angles to constrain costs are diminishing. Um, and so, you know, so any kind of a, a, an uptick in energy prices would have a direct impact for sure. So let's, let's then uh, turn it over to the audience. Uh, you have a microphone here if, you, if, you, if you'd like to come up and ask a question. Um, it, it, it's all yours. What's on your mind? Come on, Jim. <laughs> if I have to write down a question, you know there's going to be trouble. Oh, no. <laughs> you, want, you want it on YouTube, but that's it. <laughs> so. My apologies in advance, Phil, because this is probably not your area. No, it's fine. It's fine. But it's something I'm very curious about since we have these two in particular here in the same room. I'm going to ask it anyway. Oh, goodness. Um, at a public meeting very recently, EPA said that they're going to interpret the LCSA, the Slotenberg Chemical Act, um, they're going to interpret this new term, conditions of use, as uh, a mandate really to consider every conceivable scenario, uh, the way they described it, not their word, but the way I perceived it was them considering every conceivable scenario in which a chemical is manufactured, used, and even the ultimate disposition after use, and to aggregate all those different uh, data. Do you agree with this interpretation, question one, and two, how could this impact the length of time to evaluate chemicals, especially commodities with multiple uses? Okay, who'd like a piece of that? Well, I'll be happy to take, <laughs> take a shot, and, and for, for Tosca geeks, we know exactly what Jim is referring to, but in the law, in this new reform Tosca, there is a new term called condition of use, or conditions of use. And it's used disparately throughout many sections of the new law. And there is considerable concern now with how EPA is interpreting the term conditions of use for regulatory rulemaking and new chemical approval purposes. Um, so Jim, you characterized an interpretation that would suggest that some believe EPA is interpreting that term in a way that might be interpreted aggressively uh, for purposes, say, for example, of an existing chemical. If EPA is required to consider every condition of use of that chemical, not only the manufacturer, but its processing, distribution, use, and ultimate disposal, might that be a time-consuming, burdensome, and, and very disruptive process that could yield results that might be disproportionate to other aspects of the rulemaking per, uh, functionality. So I think EPA would be well advised to be clearer about how that term is being used in section five, which is new chemicals, in section six, existing chemical risk evaluations. What, we, what is a reasonable interpretation of that term? Because obviously every single condition 
by every single processor or every single distributor or every single user and every single disposer, is it not a, a feasible or efficient use of, of resources? Does that, does that run counter to the idea that we were talked about in, in, uh, prior to this of, of reasonably foreseeable uses? Does that, does that get well beyond that? Well, I, I think some would argue that the reasonably foreseeable is a term that similarly, you know, it's an embedded part in the flip side of what is a condition of use. So reasonably foreseeable from whose perspective? So for example, if you're a new chemical manufacturer, are the reasonably foreseeable uses of your substance those that are specifically identified in your notification to the agency and those that you would reasonably expect to have that chemical used, or might it con can include every conceivable mismanagement scenario that are neither reasonably foreseeable nor intended uses of your product? And so how do you balance the misuse of a chemical and uses where people are creative? There might be new uses that the manufacturer didn't anticipate. Is that reasonably foreseeable or not? You know, EPA is struggling. I think EPA is solicitous of our views. Uh, but I do think it needs much greater clarity, and particularly in the new chemical area where we, we've got a backlog of new chemicals because of disarray in applying the new law in ways that I think are disserving the industry and society right now because we need the supply chain to continue with new chemicals and not having clearly defined interpretive definitions and applications uh, is, is uh, causing some disarray right now. But you know, the law is new, the hour is young, the agency is solicitous of our views, and I think we need to work with the EPA to find the right balance. Jennifer, if there's something you want to add there, please yeah. do. Otherwise, add on to it the, the, what Lynn brought up about, about approving new chemicals. There does seem to be a backlog. Where are we in that part of the process? So we do have some concerns about that. We are seeing some delays. Um, and we want to make sure that we are able to meet these deadlines. We're able to continue to have this certainty of advancement um, in the market. But as, as Lynn said, you know, we're also interested in seeing that, that the interpretation of reasonable, reasonably foreseeable is targeted and focusing on the areas of highest concern. Um, it's really important that EPA not get bogged down, particularly in this early stage. These are precedent setting regulations. The way that we are going to be able to, uh, to find success with this program depends on exactly this time frame. It is quite fortunate that EPA has been open to receiving input from stakeholders. I think the more input they can gain at this stage, because it is, it does impact the entire supply chain and every person within this, every industry within that supply chain has a different viewpoint to bring to this. I think it's hard um, to assume if you're at EPA right now that one uh, player may be able to speak for the impact of somebody else along the supply chain. All of these, but you um, can't, it right. can't, and you know, and we're each going to have a different uh, take on on these impacts. So we'd love for if if we can continue on this stakeholder engagement that EPA has been uh, welcoming of so far, we would really like to encourage uh, that uh, further. Um, but I will say that from a prior experience, um, there was a fragrance ingredient that was, was one of the very first uh, materials on the, on the work plan uh, that EPA uh, put through. And this, um, this material had been cleared by the Europeans, having worked on regulatory harmonization in the past, you know, it seems sort of inconceivable that we would spend um, primary resources on something that the Europeans had already looked at and cleared. Um, and when we found out, you know, after going through all of the um, all of the data, we got to the point where EPA also cleared the same material. And so, I suppose, in some respects, you want to make sure that. EPA has the opportunity to make those assessments and validate those. Um, but it also seems that, that when you're talking about uh, primary re use of resources and where they're most impactful, you know, utilizing somebody else's good work recent makes work, right? and recent work makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. And that that too would help us stay on target in terms of deadlines. So Phil, I was stalling to give you a, give you an opportunity. What would you like to throw in here? No, no, I was just I was thinking that um, uh, I had two thoughts, and you, you'll see the connection. One is the challenge for the new administration is in some sense providing leadership, and you know, especially when you know cabinet nominees and then the sub cabinet are just delayed. We're providing leadership and then tapping into expertise. 
you know, both in the agencies and then with a broader policy community, um, well, like we have here on stage. And that's it's just always a challenge for a new administration that comes in and says, well, we know it. You know, there's, there's also this tendency, whatever the previous guys did is wrong. And that's not, it's just not always the case, right? There's going to be disagreements, but not always. And that's, that's the challenge. And, um, you know, hopefully the new administration sometimes will, you know, A, get their leadership in place and B, move, uh, move forward. So thanks for your question, Jim. Other questions from the audience? Who would, uh, anyone else like to go to the microphone? I would suggest that if you have a question, just come on up and, and, and stand. That'll let me know if there's a, a, a little bit of demand from the audience. I'm going to change the subject a little Please bit. Please do. Go ahead. I'm Houston Miller. I'm from the commission department here. So I guess my question is going to be you know, a little bit myopic on the academic side of thing. I, I would say that we're in the business of, of two, form, uh, two parts of the supply chain. One is intellectual capital, largely driven by federal funded research, and others is human capital in the sense of training of undergraduates, graduate students who then get hired by you all. And I, I think my perspective and that of many of my colleagues in this industry is that both of those are feeling a little threatened now. And so I guess that's the question is, how do you see that evolving in 2017? Okay. Sure. Take a volunteer. I can, say, uh, I can say a little bit. And I'll, look, I'm, I'm in the same industry. So, uh, right, I mean, we're, um, we have the same, uh, you know, the same balance sheet in a sense. Um, public versus private, but otherwise the same, you know, many of the same funding sources. Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm well, an economist, and I'm the, um, I'm on the American Economics As Association's Committee on Government Relations. I'm the chair of that. And it's one of the issues that we discuss is funding for economic research, and it affects, so this, we're, we're peanuts compared to, uh, you know, lab-based science. Um, we all understand the fiscal challenge. And to me, that's the, that's the challenge for the country, is how do we make the fiscal adjustment over time while maintaining our priorities? Um, so I wrote a paper a couple years ago with, um, uh, uh, it was with my counterpart, who was in the same job I had, chief economist at the Treasury, for, um, for Tim Geithner, so at the Treasury under President Obama. And one of the things we pointed out was that the fiscal adjustment was especially important, you know, not just for sustainability and make sure we don't you know, look like Argentina or Greece, but so we could maintain our priorities, that if we don't adjust um, you know, our fiscal policies, we're essentially going to be maintaining um, programs that really benefit upper middle, you know, upper income, um, you know, upper middle class and, and upper incomes. And we can think of those as you know, tax policies relating to health care, real estate, um, you know, retirement programs, uh, which are super important for social purposes and for lower income Americans. But the bulk of the dollars don't go to lower income Americans. Um, and if we don't think about how to, how to make progress there and make the adjustment, we're going to crowd out scientific research, but we're going to crowd out Head Start. We're going to crowd out preschool teachers for you know, low-income uh, families. Um, so I know it's not a direct, a direct answer, but it's, to me that's the, uh, the challenge. And it feels like we're just, boy, we're at the very beginning. If anything, during the campaign, we kind of walked in the opposite direction of dealing with this, uh, this priority, this challenge of priorities. Maybe I'll take just a little bit of a different twist and say that um, as somebody who is spending some time now at, uh, at a number of chemical manufacturing sites, one of the things that we're actually uh, really encouraged by is the idea of having a continued advancement in manufacturing back here in the United States. Um, so for your students, I would say that I'm enjoying walking through my member company's labs and seeing quite a number of young people in the, in the labs who are doing really innovative work, who are co-designing products that have never been designed before for these very highly specialized and high value um, applications. And so um, if we're able to maintain uh, that, that push for increasing our manufacturing base at least from my, my members' perspectives, we're prepared to grow, uh, and that means uh, uh, new and, and uh, advanced job security for, for your students. Lynn, thoughts? Just, um, I think the obvious that we would hope that the new administration would continue to fund and not diminish any type of R&D that might be supportive of the chemical community and innovation generally, and I fear that that may not be the case. And with regard to human capital, I would hope that any immigration policy does not have an untoward impact on the availability of resources from around the world that might disproportionately impact and curtail 
uh, valuable resources in this country. So this is. I, I want to strongly agree with that. It's like, I mean, we have the same issue that our, you know, our, we have great students from all over the world who finish and then you know, face these pressures. And, and well, and I was going to go exactly that same place. So this is really as much an ACS issue as, as, as it is for the organizations that, that you see. And there's, there are a couple of things that are of concern to us. Um, obviously, uh, stable and reliable funding for, for the sciences is, is, is extraordinarily important for, for our members. And to take another piece of where, where, where Phil was going, uh, was, was uh, um, immigration and visa issues on a couple of levels. One is with participation in, in our meetings and having scientists free to come from all over the world to come to participate in, 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 in the exchange of, of knowledge at our, our meetings. But second, you know, for universities, it's gotten to be more and more important for students from offshore coming as, as students here, and then there are very limited spaces for staying at the end of that, at the end of that, that education. And, and actually, you know, perhaps not a lot of jobs if they go back home either. So it's a concern, it, it's, it's a concern that we have of top to bottom. And, and thank you for bringing, bringing that up. It's, it, it, it's interesting to see that you have perspectives, you know, longitudinally here in the, in, in the industry. Um, other questions from the audience? Or if we have any from, from the web? Then let me go a little bit different direction, um, a, little, a little different topic. In, 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 uh, Bloomberg Business Week last week, there was an, a nice interview with Jeff Immelt from, from GE. And one of the things that he talked about was the investment recession in the US. That over the course of, of the past few years, the amount of capital that's been expended um, in the US is, is declined or, in, or insufficient to, to support growth. And one of the things that he touched on in, in, in this part of his, his, his interview was the ability to repatriate from, from, uh, from overseas. So we touched a little bit about that in, in terms of trade. Now, Phil, I want to go to you for a second, uh, you know, on a, on a bit of a policy basis and talk about what do we do about that? And does that fit in with some of the other things we've talked about? How do we bring that money home? Yeah, I mean, he, uh, you know, um, uh, Mr. Emelt, can't, he can repatriate the money, he just pay the, the tax. Um, and that's, just, that's, uh, that's part of the discussion of tax reform. The, the Brady Ryan plan would, you know, would uh, essentially solve his problem, you know, in a way I think he, he mostly would support, but, um, uh, you know, but it's, it's, a, it's a difficult issue, um, just because it's wrapped up, but we, it's, it's hard to solve the international tax problem that, uh, that Mr. Immel, um highlights without addressing the, the overall U.S. business tax system, and then, of course, since so many businesses are pass-throughs, right, um, that, that leads you to say, okay, we need to address the individual tax system, and so it's just, um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to take it on. Uh, a little, uh, a little at a time. I, I, I do have one, one more thought, which of course we do have experience with this, with a, a repatriation holiday, uh, and there's a lot of research on it. It actually happened when I was in, in the White House uh, at the Council of Economic Advisors, and I would say that this is the promises of the good things that would result are, are overstated, I and mean, that's that's the result of um, of the research. It's still a good thing, but I would say it's a good thing as part of an overall tax reform. Um, and again, the goal of the overall tax reform is to make the U.S. economy stronger, um, and that's you know. So doing it as part of that is is, uh, is a good thing. I just wouldn't do I wouldn't do the repatriation on its own because the, our experience is not uh, you know not so positive. What about capex? What, what's what, what's your experience with the industry in terms of investing in the U.S. and what do you see in the future? Either, either Jennifer. I'm going to yield to Jennifer because you speak for your members. <laughs> and I, have, I can give up one tiny thought after. after. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what's nice is I'm not picking up a lot of, um, of uh, disillusion out there in the membership. I think there's um, been quite a number of uh, growth efforts, at least within our membership, that I've seen. Um, and so in terms of actual capital investment, I do know that there have been um, some members that have enjoyed being able to, to invest um, recently and continue to do that. Um, so with at least from our members' point of view, not seeing a lot of contraction, um, but seeing either current growth plans or poised to grow. So uh, from the, the commodity chemical industry perspective, you know, if you look at, I think Kevin Swift has a number from, from ACC that well north of $100 billion of investment announced, particularly in terms of ethylene crackers mm -hmm. taking advantage of, of, of natural gas. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty significant 
amount. And at the same time, I think last year was the first year, and Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, last year was the first year that on a Chinese basis that, that there was less capital coming into China than there was China investing in other, in, in, in other countries. So it seems like it's turning. Lynn, you had, you had something you wanted to get well, in. Well, I'm just, you know, capital investment obviously is a good thing. And to the extent it can spur the economy and spur job development, that's all good. I think from my kind of more provincial perspective of having investment available to some of the younger startup innovative thought incubators, the uh, college and university spin-offs that have you know, a new widget or a new technology in some of these pioneering areas of SynBio and biotech and, and nano and convergence uh, technologies generally. It'd be great to see more available resources for those because there's been a decided diminished amount over the last five, seven years in, in, um, uh, in, in the venture capital sector and in other investment sectors that are either unwilling or unable or have been decidedly um, less generous in funding some of these opportunities. And I'm hopeful that some of the CapEx surge will benefit that sector of the economy because we need it. Cool. Yeah, no, no, I agree. It's an interesting issue that um, it, among macroeconomists, there's kind of two schools of thought, well, at least two schools of thought. Really? Among yeah, economists? Yeah. Two <laughs> schools of thought? One, one, at yeah, least three, <laughs> three hands. Um, right, there's a, there's a, this is as good as a get school. It's uh, Robert Gordon at, the Northwest, at Northwestern. Um, there's another group. Uh, is, uh, Jim Stock at Harvard, Mark Watson at, uh, at Princeton, uh, John Fernald at uh, the San Francisco Fed are about to um, come out with a paper um, saying, you know, look, we're really poised. Like investment is poised to rebound, that we sort of had the overhang of the financial crisis and, you know, they, you know they've got other things. But those headwinds have abated and here we go. Boy, that's sure a hopeful, uh, hopeful thing. But then it leads to the other, the kind of compositional effect is that there's still a sense in which the companies that are able to borrow are the ones that, or, let me put it differently. The, the, the people, I was, I was about to just go down a rabbit hole there, um, just to make it simpler. Um, uh, the people who, who we want to be able to have access to credit are still finding it challenging, and that's the innovation. Innovative firms, young firms, small firms, we see that in, in many aspects, in many dimensions. On the residential housing side, right, household formation is down and home ownership among you know, young, young families is down as a result. And this is sort of a mirror image of what's happening on the, um, on the business side. And you add that impact of just diminished income to the uncertainty of the trajectory yeah. on going forward of new product or existing yeah. product review as a consequence of this new super duper Tosca. I mean, it adds this overwhelming sense of uncertainty mm -hmm. That has to be very disquieting to markets, and yet I've seen this: the market, the stock prices just continue to, to increase. So how do you yeah. how do you so I, fact, that? I, say, I have one bit of good <laughs> one one thing of good news, and, and you'll see the analogy. So in 1986, right, we had uh, President Reagan had a, a large scale tax reform. Um, you know, we've had lots of tax bills since then, but people look back as '86 is the, the last time we did wholesale tax reform. But if you look at, at measures of the macro economy, there was a pause, right? Job creation paused while this was while tax reform was being debated. And then it was put in place and it, you know, it's looked back. Is the point of that because of the uncertainty associated with it? It's hard to identify exactly what, but that's got to be part of it. So I'm hopeful that and so there's the, the stock market and you know, who knows, but maybe this, uh, what's going on in the stock market is, is evaluating the, the policy world and saying, look, we get it. There's uncertainty, but we think at the end it's going to turn out OK. I hope that's right, but I understand the, uh, you know, the uncertainty. And, and the problems that cause it. Well, and, and how do some of these um, benefits really start filtering through the economy so we're not just benefiting a, a, a small few elite and we really do actualize some of the promises that were made in at least Mr. Trump's triumphant bid for the presidency. I, I hope that comes through, but uh, a little less hopeful on that front. All right, so let me ask you, uh, I have a question for each of you, and this is, this is uh, we we had a little discussion prior to to this about how, how the president um, prefers to get personal briefings on things, perhaps over over dinner rather than to to spend a lot of time reading. So let's let's take that hypothesis. And what I'm going to do is you you've been invited to the White House for dinner, and um, you're you you've been asked to bring along one of the four following people to have a discussion <laughs> <coughs> with him and, and the president. So the four people you can choose from are uh, Wilbur Ross. Secretary of Commerce, Scott Pruitt for EPA, Steve Nurchin at, at, at Treasury, and 
riparian energy. So you can bring one along to have dinner with the president. Who do you pick? <laughs> and what do you tell him? Jennifer? <laughs> Give you the first Thanks. Uh, I have to pick Pruitt. Um, it's the most direct connect. I know Lynn will be upset with me for that. But <laughs> we'll share. We'll share the conversation with him. Right. Um, but uh, but certainly, you know, I, I think as we talked about before, you know, there are quite a number of uh, environmental regulations, things that are in place that are important to our membership. We've been at this for a long time. Um, the the quick. The quick summary is, let's keep our head down, do the work that we need to get done on behalf of the entire industry. And I think, I think there's a lot of upsides for um, what we have in front of us. Um, there's a lot of good work that's been done so far and, uh, and good intention uh, to make this, this work from all sides. So, um, so let's keep going. All right, Lynn. Well, I'm, I'm going to presume that Mr. Pruitt is no longer available as my dinner guest. <laughs> um, yes, they only get to go to dinner once. Right, and, and uh, chances are uh, we would have a robust discussion over many topics. But I, I think I would go with Mr. Ross, uh, recognizing that um, commerce is a very, very important element in this debate. And it would be um, interesting to just point out you know, just how interrelated the chemical industry is with everything in commerce. And sometimes I see a lot of siloing going on. I think. The Obama um, Commerce Department made more concerted efforts to be more integrated and to be more granular on some issues impacting both big um, chemical enterprise and small and, and startup, which we're encouraging. And I would urge those opportunities to continue to make sure that there's much more cross-talking between EPA and commerce and um, instead of just you know, the echo chambers that go on within each, each segment. So I would, I would uh, ask as my dinner date, uh, Mr. Ross. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, all, look, all four would be important. You know, naturally, I'd, I'd say the Treasury Secretary to answer the, you know, the question is asked. Um, and hopefully the discussion would be about some of this, you know, uh, the overall economy, growth, uh, and, and how to boost um, the U.S. trajectory and some of our, our competitiveness, you know, in the way that economists think about it, which is uh, productivity growth. And it seems like that would be a, a worthwhile discussion. And some of this to say, you know, businesses worry about their competitiveness. Let's think about how do we translate that into the macro economy. Well, ultimately, that's that's productivity. It's the right the supply of capital, the supply of labor, and, and skilled labor. Um, you know, human capital, and how does that translate into productivity? Okay, so I want to I want to check the audience again. Are there are there people with questions outside? Rob, come on up. Thanks, Bill. And thanks for everybody on the panel. This has been really interesting this morning. Uh, Lynn, I have a question for you. And it might not be fair. Uh, so it won't be the first time. <laughs> but you were talking earlier about the uh, executive order on two for one. Right. How much uncertainty there is in that, how it actually would play out, it's not clear. Mm -hmm. But I understand that Canada has a similar policy in place and has for at least a, a handful of years. And I think the UK might have as well. Do you know anything you can share with this group that might be instructive to the administration as they try to make? Their executive order. Yeah. Well, turning your very good question around back at you, I would urge the administration to see what worked. And I think what are, might be fairly characterized as more narrowly drawn um, UK and Canadian initiatives, we have learned a lot from the Canadian approach to chemicals management in particular. And, and many, many of us urged Congress years ago to be looking north of the border to pick what was best and most successful with the Canadian approach to chemicals. So I, I, do, I am aware that both um, the UK in some instances and Canada have a similar program. I think it's more narrowly drawn. There have been success stories. And I would look, urge our current administration in, in implementing this uh, one in, two out provision to see what has worked and what hasn't and build upon their experience. And I, and I don't want you to misinterpret my remarks um, about, you know, aspirationally, it's a great idea, practically, and in terms of implementation, there's a lot to be desired. I think if it were clearer about what's in, what's out, how this is going to be done, because even that process itself invites transactional costs and burdens that need to be quantified in a way that doesn't become a circuitous gee, isn't this exactly what we were hoping to, to diminish? 
So I think with greater clarity, learning what has worked and avoiding what hasn't might be a good exercise. So excellent point. Other perspective panels? No? No? Well, we're, uh, I'll, I'll, once again, I'll ask if, there's, if there are more questions from the audience. Well, I have one question for you, Bill. Go since right ahead. Mr. Since Mr. Perry is now dateless, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that you would, you would ask Rick out to dinner. Well, <laughs> Lynn, the mind boggles. Um, um, it, it, well, it would, it, would, it would be interesting. I have to, I have to say that uh, I, was, I was really way more impressed with, with, with his testimony mm -hmm. than I expected to be. As were um, we all. And per particularly because it was very clear that coming into this, he thought the energy department was about oil and gas. Right. The energy department is not. It's about, it's about managing some of, some of the, the large nuclear sites. It, it is a huge right. management issue that goes well beyond promoting oil and gas. And the fact that he showed up at, 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 his, at his, his hearing and, and had some perspective on that, I thought showed a, a lot of growth in, 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 the, oh, and in, humility. in the month. Right. So, right. so I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the long view of that. Let's see how, let's see how, yeah. that, how, that, how that works out. All right, so we're coming down to the end. We're kind of into injury time here, and we've got, uh, uh, we've got a, a little bit left. We touched on this just briefly, and I want to go, I want to go back to this just for a second. Um, we seem to be living in a world where, where uh, multilateral trade agreements are going by the board, and we're going to be more and more into bilaterals. Um, should we take the opportunity to negotiate a new uh, overarching bilateral trade agreement with China, starting from the idea that, that if, you, if you accept some of the early rhetoric from, from the administration, essentially what it was saying is, this ain't working for me anymore, we need to start over. Is, is that the sort of thing that we, that, we, that we should be doing? Anybody? You know, we've, um, we've you negotiated were... bilateral agreements in some things, like investment, environmental goods, um, technology products. Uh, it kind of feels like the relationship isn't there yet for the kind of bilateral agreement that we have with you know, Australia and you know, Canada and Mexico, the trilateral agreement, that um, you know, we, really, we really need to work through some of our um, uh, disagreements on the economic side, uh, including the protection of intellectual property uh, in particular, and including chemical, uh, in the chemical industry. Um, work through those before the kind of broader agreement is, uh, is ripe. But at least on a trajectory basis, it seems we're getting more to the point of where the two countries need each other more than it's, it's, it's one way versus the I, other. I absolutely agree with that. The, the, on the economic side, where um, you know, the economies are uh, intertwined in important ways, doesn't mean we could unravel that, but there would be um, you know, costs to un uh, unraveling it for both sides. Absolutely. Lynn? Well, intuitively, it seems like a good idea. I mean, from a, an aspirational perspective, we've heard many more publicized imbalances that Mr. Trump has vowed to correct, that the art of the deal is to perfect a better, more equal distribution of assets and a more equitable um, a, you know, trade relationship. So to the extent that we can enter benefits and perhaps address some of the more well-publicized you know, human rights concerns in, in, in China and not, you know, give a blind eye to what, what goes on there. I think there's much to be gained. Whether it could happen, uh, an entirely separate question. Jennifer, thoughts? Yeah. So I think Phil makes a good point about, um, about the maturity that uh, could stand to be gained, but uh, of the relationship and the understanding about what's important um, in those kinds of uh, uh, deliberations. But, um, but really picking up on the point of, about intellectual property, and that's been the most difficult piece of, of doing business with China. The, the importance of, of the exchange is, is well known. It's, it's, um, it's an important uh, trading partner. We import, they export, all of those things. But there are just so many opportunities for us to um, to look, to put ourselves in a position where our intellectual property is compromised, but whether that's um, in in terms of, of a revolution of process um, or formulation, and I think that those types of understandings, when we can get closer to a mutual understanding of that importance, um, then then I think a, a, an agreement could be could be considered. 
Thank you all. I, I think that brings us about to the end of our uh, allotted time. For those of you who are, are listening, to make sure that you receive any in invitations for uh, this in future ACS Science in the Congress project briefings, please send an email to science underscore congress at acs.org. And with that, I will thank our panel. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and for all you for listening. <laughs>